So today, Alice, we're going to see Tom Martin. Yes, also known as Farmer Tom. Really looking forward to catching up with him on his latest thoughts on public money for public goods and also his face time of farmer initiative. And I've heard he's got a no-till drill as well, so I think ah, that'll be really interesting yeah, to see. Yeah, definitely. Shall we go and see him? Yeah, why not? So thank you very much for welcoming us here today, Tom. It's wonderful to be here. That's great to have you. You're welcome. Oh, great. Well, um, I just thought we'd start off by actually just asking you about your farm and what you've currently got set up here. Fantastic. Well, I farm here in northwest Cambridgeshire. Uh, we're a medium-sized family farm uh, and we farm predominantly arable, so wheat, uh, which is largely feed wheat and some milling, uh, barley, linseed and rapeseed, and then we also have a little bit of grass where we fatten lambs through the winter. Fabulous. So obviously you're quite an active farmer, you're very communicative, you have your little Twitter session, of course FaceTime a farmer, yeah. which we'll chat about later. Just really interested in hearing more about that. What is your story in ag? How come you're so interested in these two things combined? Well, I grew up on a farm, so I have yeah. the, the kind of farming background. I love the countryside around me. Um, I really enjoy being out here. But I um, left uh, university and became a consultant and analyst for uh, a little while, working in business strategy. Then I worked in news and magazines distribution. And then I latterly worked for 10 years for Universal Pictures in wow. film distribution. So. Okay. Um, not the, your typical journey into right. agriculture at all, <laughs> but I think there's some things you learn from all kinds of different careers. Yeah, um, certainly some of the soft skills that you can bring from business to business. And, uh, and that's what I've tried to do in farming. I spent a lot of time in, in marketing meetings talking about branding and how we communicate to the customer. And that's something that I really want to do in farming as well, particularly helping people to see what happens on the other side of the farm gate. Well, that sounds awesome, Tom. Thanks for sharing your story. Can we go and take a look around now? Yeah, let's go for it. Awesome, let's go. So Tom, you've just changed your drill. Tell us a little bit about why this drill and what it does for you. For 15 years we've operated a min-till system and I've just been particularly interested in moving towards no-till. I definitely wouldn't describe myself as a, as a zealot for any particular um, uh, way of working, uh, but this just gives us so much more um, capability of working in different ways. It's a direct drill, so it can go straight into stubbles, it can go, we can work with min-till and ploughed land as well, but also we've got three tanks, which means that, for example, in our rapeseed, we're able to drill rapeseed with DAP underneath it uh, and put in the burst seam clover all at the same time. So when you look at the tillage as well, uh, the operations it's replacing, it's really doing five operations in one pass. <laughs> So Tom, we've just come from seeing your drill. There's two fields here that you've used uh, to drill uh, with it. Um, what have you done differently between the two? That's right, so these are two spring barley fields. Uh, this one over here, we call it horse close. Um, this was drilled into um, a sprayed off longer term pasture uh, about six weeks ago. Um, so it went into a grass, lots of rich organic matter uh, and, uh, and a reasonable seedbed. Uh, the field over here, over my left shoulder, uh, is elm tree. Sadly, no more elm trees there after Dutch elm disease, but that was a, that's been a long-term arable. Uh, and we put in a cover crop, which was a spring pea to build the nitrogen, uh, a spring linseed for lots of lovely shallow rooting, and a, and a winter oat for some, for some deep, deeper rooting. And have you used cover crops before, spring barley before? We have for one year. Um, but the difference is this year we've uh, used them a bit more extensively across the farm and we've grazed them off as well. So that um, is something we're really starting to, to engage with. We have a local shepherdess who brings her sheep and um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. And do you think it's um, bringing benefits using a, a cover crop to your system? It's certainly a great way to get lots of green vegetation above ground into a, a usable format relatively quickly and the sheep didn't seem to do a good job without uh, without trampling the ground down too much. So um, uh, the answer is we'll wait till harvest to wait and see, but um, at the moment it looks okay. So Tom, we're standing in a field of Zayat, I think, isn't it? Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you established this field. Uh, so this field last year was our worst field in terms of black grass. Uh, it had been 15 years of min-till uh, and for the last few years we've been ploughing our, our very, very worst field each year. So we turned this over, um, knocked it down and, uh, and drilled it probably about the middle of, 
uh, middle of October, about the 20th of October, with the idea of really doing everything we can to, uh, to, to defeat the black grass. Of course, it's the month of May now, you start off with fields looking wonderful and then you pick out, you suddenly realise that the black grass is coming through. But there seems to be, looking at it, less than a, a seed head per, per square metre, which is a, a, a big difference versus last year. And so in terms of black grass, ploughing, delayed drilling, yeah. anything else? What, what other tactics are you using to try and keep on top of it? Um, we've brought a lot more spring cropping back into the system, so we're probably 20 to 25% spring barley. Um, we already grow a little bit of linseed and we use that where we need to as well. Um, we've been using cover cropping to try and stimulate the growth during the winter and springtime. Um, we graze that off and, uh, and direct drill that. Um, and we've been really fastidious about, um, uh, about blowing down uh, balers, combine harvesters and machinery like that just to make sure that we're not transferring any seed. Do you think you're getting on top of Black Cross by doing all of those things or is it still a running <laughs> battle? How do you... I, I would never be as bold as to say we are, we're, we're, we're winning but we're certainly holding our own uh, and we haven't had the problems in the last three or four years that we had uh, in the harvest of, of, of years gone by. And on some of your easier fields, are you establishing the same way? Do you plough everything before? Or? No, we're moving towards a, a no-till system. We're really trying not, to, not to, um, to disturb the surface of the ground. And in fact, after harvest, we now, instead of uh, when we used to min-till, we used to disc the ground relatively quickly. We now leave it till a minimum of a week to 10 days after the first rainfall event after harvest, just to try and get those seeds to, yeah. to chit and grow or be predated um, so that we just take them out of, out of the rotation, out of the production cycle. So. And so if you've got a field that you can show us, which is um, direct drilled? Yeah, I've got a field just next door, which is direct drilled. Uh, it had the same operations last year, so it's a really good example to look at. OK, let's go. Right. So this field is at exactly the same point in the rotation, very similar preceding crops, but established using a direct drill. We uh, let the wheat volunteers from our first wheat last year grow up and we sprayed them with glyphosate in early October before we drilled in the middle of October at the same, same time. So is this um, a cheaper way of establishing your wheat crop? Absolutely, so it's, it's, it's cheaper financially, so it's about £175 a hectare to establish versus £265 plus in the preceding field. But also I think it's, it's cheaper, it has less impact in terms of the number of passes. This needed one pass with a sprayer, one pass with a direct drill, and then one pass with the rolls. And we did about five or six different jobs just in those three passes. So um, a lot kinder to the soil uh, and a lot better from my perspective in terms of trying to establish a, a decent crop. But if you look at the crop, maybe it isn't quite as even as the plough? Definitely. Uh, there's definitely. It's definitely not quite such a good looking crop. It's a little bit more patchy. Um, there are some gaps where there's been some, some bridging with the, um, uh, with the seed in the ground. Um, but again, it, it, it's all about when it comes to harvest. Uh, if we can make more profit, even if we're making a slightly lower yield, then, then we're doing better as a business. So, um, so that's what we're and, looking and for. And what sort of yield would you expect of this field compared to the, the plough one? Um, well, on our farm, we would call um, nine, nine and a bit tonnes to the hectare um, a good yield. So on the plough, I'd probably expect to be around that region. Uh, this looks like it might be, might be half a tonne poorer, but there's uh, three months between now and harvest for all kinds of things to rob us of yield. So uh, it's a little bit wait and see. Tom, let's talk about public money for public goods. What do you think about this in this current policy landscape? Well, I think as, as a farmer, I'm a food producer, but I also am a, a steward of the countryside, and that's something I take great pride in. Mm -hmm. And I can definitely see the way that the pol public policy is going is that we'll be rewarded for, for producing public goods. And I think there are a number of those. We, we're really proud of the environmental measures that we have on this farm, but I think education is a really, really important public good. Yeah, um, and I know Michael Gove has been recently talking about uh, the value of working in between departments. So that's education. Uh, food and farming and also health as well. Oh, it's so interesting and um, obviously we've seen a lot of your activity on Twitter and other ways. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your FaceTime a Farmer initiative? I'd love to talk about that. FaceTime a Farmer <laughs> is a, uh, a fortnightly 10 minute FaceTime or Skype call between one farmer and one classroom. Currently we have 220 farmers signed up and they each have their own class. That's about six and a half thousand school children wow. who are Skyped into farms once a week. The teacher will email the farmer typically a couple of days before the call and say this is what we're studying genetics climate change water pollinators worms soil whatever it might be and the farmer positions them somewhere 
itself somewhere on the farm that's um, that's appropriate to that and they have a, a short conversation. I mean that's just brilliant to see how it's all lined up to the curriculum and inspiring a new generation of people to either get into farming themselves or actually just support rural communities. That's right, it's incredibly important and I would recommend it to anybody. Facetimeofarmer.com is the website and all the details are on there and people can sign up from there. Very handy call to action. Thanks very much Tom. Thank you.